the decision. When my phone rang at 4 a.m. that morning in September 2017, my heart started racing as it did whenever I got a call that early in the morning. My father's caregiver just never seemed to understand the concept of the time difference between Jamaica and Vancouver. But if she was calling that early in the morning, I knew it wasn't going to be good news. So as I reached across for the phone, I felt my stomach churning. Hi, Diana. Is Daddy okay? Miss Tanya, me can't do it no more. Me can't do it no more. What can't you do anymore, Diana? Miss Tanya, it getting too bad now. It getting too bad. Yesterday, him wake me again. It, it have something have to happen. It can't go on like this. I sighed because that had become my default when talking to Diana because I couldn't do very much living this far from Jamaica. This had been the fourth such call that I'd had in the last two weeks and I knew. I knew I had to make a decision. It was going to be a very difficult decision but it was a necessary decision. But because I didn't know how much my father's cognitive skills had deteriorated and I wasn't sure if he would know, I didn't want to make that decision because I didn't want to hurt him. And I guess more than anything else, I didn't want him to hate me. And I had promised him that I wouldn't do it and I had made a promise to myself that I wouldn't hurt him like that. But as I listened to Diana talk about what had become her new normal each night, I knew I couldn't delay that decision anymore. Miss Tanya, me hear him from 4 a.m. this morning in my bang bang pot, in my knock knock, everything around the place. Could he be knocking at 4 a.m. in the morning, Diana? He might knock pot, he might knock pan, and he might use him walking stick, and all he might do is bang, bang, or make up all the noise at 4 a.m. And Miss Tanya, him too heavy to lift now. Me had to call the mirror heads down the road. And if we never have good neighbors, me don't know what me would do. Okay, Diana. I'll have to figure something out. Give me a day, and I'll get back to you. Hang in there though. And as I hung up, I knew. I knew Diana kept calling me because she knew I had a power of attorney. And I knew his dementia had progressed remarkably. So I knew we needed a little bit more care. But I didn't want to be that one. I didn't want to be that daughter. So after hanging up, my mind drifted back to that rainy Saturday afternoon in 2006 when I'd gotten another call. My sister had called to let me know that my mother had had a stroke and that I needed to come visit and say goodbye. Now when she called, I just, I. I just kept thinking, she's strong. She's a woman of faith. I can't come now because I was a new immigrant. I didn't have job security yet. If I visited, then they'd have to find a sub. And I was, I was part-time at the college. I, I didn't feel that I had the right to ask for them to get up. I didn't feel I had the right to ask them to get a sub. And who would care about my life? Who would care? And so 
even though she said come i said no i'll come in august when i got holidays and she kept saying come now come now and i said she's not going to die but she did two days after that phone call she died and i was a daughter who put work before her mother i was the daughter who couldn't find the time to say goodbye to her mother so i couldn't be the daughter who let down her father this time no not again i would not do that again and since i didn't get a chance to show her how much I really loved her, I would have to show my father that I loved him. I loved him more than I had shown my mom that I loved her. I needed to show my father that I appreciated him, that I cared for him, that I was grateful for the sacrifices that they made for us that I appreciated the great lifestyle that they had given me growing up in Jamaica, that I would always look after them because they looked after me way beyond what parents needed to do. So I was going to do all that I could do for him. And so I called my therapist as usual to talk about the same things that we had been talking about for the last six weeks, the need to make that decision. And I went through everything again and I reminded him about my mother and how I was still mourning the fact that I didn't do enough. I didn't visit my mother. I reminded him that as a Jamaican, we didn't do that. It was not Jamaican culture. If you do that, you dishonor your parents. I already dishonored my mother. I already didn't visit her when she was dying, when I knew she was in a coma. How could I do this to my father now? And I told him that before my dad's dementia had progressed, I had asked him and he had told me no. He didn't want that and I didn't want to go against what he wanted. But my therapist stopped me at that point and he said, I hear you. I hear what you say your father wanted. But let's pretend for one moment that your mother was right here, right now, right beside you. What would she see? If you told her about the sleepwalking, if you told her how many times they had found him on the ground, if you told her how many times the caregiver woke up at 6 a.m. and found him in the living room, on the ground, unable to move, not knowing where he was. If you told her that you got a second caregiver to help the first caregiver. And then you got a third caregiver to help the first and the second caregiver. And it still kept happening. He still kept falling and hurting himself. If you told her that the last time he fell, just this morning, and when they woke, they found him in the kitchen squashed between the stove and the fridge with his walker band on. If you told her all of that, what would she say? And when he said that, I couldn't help the assault of tears because I knew. He said, what would she say? I knew what she would say. She would say, Tani, I love you. Tani, there's nothing to forgive you for. 
I don't hold it against you that you didn't. Come and say goodbye. I know why you made that decision. I know that you thought that that was your only option. But I know you love me. I know that if you knew that I was going to die, you would have come to say goodbye. And I know you love your father. And because you love your father, I am going to ask you to make a decision, not for yourself, not for your conscience, not to make yourself feel better, but I need you to make a decision for him, for him to be safe. I need you to make that decision because you love him more than you're afraid of the guilt. And so I hung up from that call determined to make the right decision. And as I dialed the number for the nursing home, I couldn't stop the tears. And I just kept saying, Daddy, please forgive me. Daddy, please forgive me. Daddy, please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. Please forgive me. I had to finally admit that even though he said he would never, ever want to die in a nursing home, I had to do what was best for him, which was being around an accountable team with a team of nurses who would give him the best care that Jamaica had to offer. I had to decide, I had to admit that it was time for me to forgive myself and it was time for me to stop putting my needs above his needs. And so when they answered, I said, I'm calling to make arrangements to admit Alton Leslie Leach into your nursing home facility. Finally, I made the decision.